Good evening, people. Welcome to the real premiere of WrestleMania. I am Dylan Skinner, and tonight, my my partner in crime, the White Rose of Newfoundland, Travis Walsh. And also, I have my own uh, I have my own uh, YouTube uh, page. You can go onto that, which is uh, www.youtube.com slash Travis Walsh. You can see my blog for all things when it comes to autism, wrestling, mixed martial arts, motivational speaking, anything local wrestling. It does. It really, uh, it really matters. And right now, one of the things that we've noticed in world professional wrestling, Dylan, is that factions have been making its its uh, reemergence. You got that right, Travis. And one of the things now, so in the WWE, we're talking about uh, Dean Ambrose. Uh, Dean Ambrose. Uh, 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 Tell me about Dean. Hmm. Dean. We're talking about Dean Ambrose, uh, Roman Reigns, and, and isn't that awful? Can't remember. Uh, the Shield. What does it say? Uh, definitely oh, the Shield. Definitely the Shield. WWE is especially with their uh, their. Uh, I suppose you could say they're pretty fairly unique interests. I mean, not a lot of wrestlers have come to the crowd, obviously because of security reasons. And of course, in TNA, we're also talking about the Aces and Eights, the very first ever, I think, biker gang. Well, biker no, gang. no, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I mean, there, there's been, uh, there's been uh, biker gang. Uh, uh, Disciples of Apocalypse with Crush back in back in the Attitude oh, yes. Area. Yeah. So, uh, as of uh, results, we're going to do our own personal top ten lists of uh, factions coming up in the, the world of professional wrestling. Now, these are the top 10 factions. I'm going to do my 10, and he's going to do his 10. These are our own personal uh, uh, lists, and also these are going to be the ones that uh, may, may not be, it's our own personal list, yes, but I think it's also going to be uh, compared to uh, the ones that we've grown up watching and, we, uh, and we've uh, um, uh, really respected, especially the ones that made an impact in the wrestling business. So obviously, if you don't see the NWO or something like that, or NWO Wolfpack or we're, anything like don't, that, well, don't cry about it. Don't cry about it. it obviously, we're going to get hate mail for this, but you know that that's the typical blog. That's so, what personal is all about, Travis. Absolutely, that's what personal is all about. So uh, you want to go to the top ten? Alrighty, let's get this thing started. Absolutely, number ten. Number ten for me is uh, the main event mafia. Now, the reason why I put the main event mafia in at number ten is because really during uh, during the professional wrestling era, especially uh, growing up, Kurt Angle, Scott Steiner, Kevin Nash, uh, Booker T, and Sting were some of the greatest icons in the professional wrestling of the nineties. Uh, and uh, really, uh, when it came to uh, really impact. They all banded together in storyline against the young blood of TNA to uh, really rebel together. And really, the way they looked, the way they dressed, they really were a mafia, a mafia of veterans. But the reason why I put them in top, the reason why I put them at number ten, was because really they had a bit of a skirmish with Sting, with his character that he wasn't a good heel. They split him up, and then they brought in Taz and Samoa Joe, which really, uh, the reboot of the main event mafia was not good at all. So that's the reason why I got him in number ten. On uh, my top 10, number 10, once again, the main event mafia. Now, the reason why I choose this is because I, like, this stable there was such, it was so much backstory with these uh, guys, you know, Absolutely. like Angle, Steiner, Sting, Nash, and uh, Booker T. Especially, especially uh, with Scott Steiner, Booker T, uh, uh, and Sting. Uh, Kevin Nash, especially when they were all during the whole WCW days, and even Charmel, even Charmel, uh, Booker T's wife was in WCW for a time, and of course it was all that group. Kurt Angle, uh, I, th I, th I think he deserved his place as not the Godfather, quote unquote. Not trying to get any copyright material here, but uh, I think he really did fit in after a while. Yeah, and plus another thing, why I choose this is because, do you realize what all of those men had had in common? They were all world champions. WCW World Champions. WCW World Champions, I stand corrected. Uh, number nine for me uh, has to be uh, Evolution. Now, uh, when you have uh, Triple H, Ric Flair, Randy Orton, and Batista all together, you know, a lot of people were calling them the, the uh, four horsemen wannabes and everything like that, but I think, I, think, I think in many cases they were our generation's four horsemen. But uh, I think they brought in a lot of something a little different too. They brought in a new essence because you had the greatest, you got the present greatest in Triple H, and you got the future greatest in Randy Orton. And, and Batista. And Batista, too. And Martin, Batista had a, real, was, had a really great run. He did. Especially, uh, a lot of people thought that he was better at a heel. And me, personally, I think that uh, Evolution was great as a three-man group. I don't, I wasn't, obviously, Batista had a uh, number of uh, bicep tears. I'm not going to say why or anything, but uh, really, uh, 
Evolution really uh, had a great run, and I think they were really good, and that's why I got it. And the reason why I have it number nine was because of the entrance of Batista. He made a great impact. He did make a great impact, but he I think so. He I basically think. destroyed Bill Goldberg. Absolutely. Okay, number nine for me is Immortal. For those of you who don't know who Immortal is, it's like the typical uh, stable there run by Eric Bischoff, the genius of professional wrestling. Evil yeah. genius of professional wrestling. Evil genius. And you have Hulk Hogan. And I don't. Hulk Hogan doesn't need an introduction. Absolutely not. Hulk Hogan really is professional wrestling. Even to this day, at 50, almost 57, 58 years old, yeah. he, with damaged knees, bad back, and all nine, you know, he still has. He still, after a lot of personal demons, I gotta say too, uh, caused by uh, you know his wife, his family, his kids. his kids, and everything like that. I mean, I mean, and now Brooke Hogan's in TNA too, which I think is good. I mean, obviously, because her singing career went down the tubes pretty fast. Uh, but uh, no offense, Brooke, we still love you. Uh, I think that uh, really uh, Hulk Hogan did make a difference in TNA, especially with the Immortal uh, faction. Uh, everybody wanted to see Hollywood Hogan again, and really he came back with a black beard and black. just wearing on black, and, and I think he, I think it really did good. For me, my number eight is the, actually the faction that started it all, the faction that created factions, and that was WCCW's The Fabulous Freebirds. Michael P.S. Hayes, the late great Terry Bam Bam Gordy, and the late great Buddy Roberts. Uh, Buddy Roberts passed away late last year. Obviously, uh, Buddy Roberts' history with uh, smoking was uh, well documented. Yeah. Uh, Terry Gordy uh, passed away in 2000 because of a heart attack. Uh, Terry Gordy was known to be uh, uh, actually it's been well documented that Terry Gordy passed away several times and was managed to uh, come, back. come back. So uh, really, our thoughts and prayers go out to Michael Hayes for losing two of your brothers. But the thing I liked about the Fabulous Freebirds is was when it came down to a heel faction a real group, they really documented what it meant to be a heel faction in the 80s. Because not only, they were they were not just the ones that started factions, they were the ones that actually brought music into professional wrestling with their, actually their debut theme, which was Bad Street USA, which I got I actually have that on my iPod, it's a very catchy song. Oh, yeah. And Michael Hayes, uh, they played it to the T. Now, the reason why I got him at number eight, I know in many people's mind, I think they should be higher, but I think after uh, everything that went down with WCCW and the Von Erichs, um, the, the highlight of their career was in 1984. After that, they had some uh, re-emergence with uh, Iceman King Parsons, where they called them the Blackbird, and it just so happens that Iceman King Parsons is black, which I found kind of disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, I gotta say, uh, the original Fabulous Papers, number eight. Oh, yeah. Great points there, Travis. Thank you. Okay, number eight for me is Evolution, because here's the thing, though. When I was a little kid, that when Evolution, I hated them because they always used to beat up like people like Chris Benoit and Shawn Michaels. But the more you think about it, that there is, a, by the way, there is a legitimate uh, age difference between me. I'm 23 and Dylan is uh, 19. 19 so I grew up in the Attitude Era. I grew up in the in the Golden Years. Hmm. And but really, when you think about it, Evolution brought out Randy Orton with. He became one of the most uh, sadistic wrestlers who ever stepped foot in the wrestling ring. I really think that Evolution brought out his talent. I mean, when it, before he got into the Evolution, and, and he had a dislocated shoulder. He really just was a bubblegum chewing baby face that was known as the son of Cowboy Bob Orton. Yeah. I didn't really see him going anywhere, but once he got into Evolution, I mean, his, his stock just went through the roof. And the longest reign in Intercontinental Champion in recent years, actually. That's true, too. And, and, and during and, that time. And the youngest World Heavyweight Champion. Yeah. So, and uh, number seven for me, uh, the first family of professional wrestling, in my opinion, which is the Bon Erics. Uh, oh, yeah. Kevin, Kerry, David, Mike, Chris, and Fritz. They were the, uh, they were the thing back in professional wrestling. Legends. Epitome of legends, especially down in Texas. There wasn't any Dallas football, but they said it best. There wasn't any Dallas football, but there was Fritz Von Erich. Yeah. And uh, really, uh, the, the tragic story about the Von Erichs. I, I think that, uh, you know, obviously all of them, except for one, Kevin now is still, Kevin's still alive, but all of his brothers are dead under very tragic circumstances. And really, I think if um, they took more gambles and took more uh, precautions as to uh, what would have happened with David, I really think that WCCW would be WWE right now. I think there wouldn't be any WWE oh, at all. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. I mean, if they would have went nationwide when Fritz didn't want to because of the old time, I mean, there's a, there, we can get into this all night, but uh, number seven got to be the Von Erich for me. Well, number seven for me is The Legacy, which is Randy Orton, former member of Evolution. True. And he brought up 
second generation superstars, Ted DiBiase and Cody Rose. Uh, fortunately for Ted DiBiase, after Legacy, you know, disband, he went nowhere, but Cody Rose, he actually had a fantastic, fantastic intercontinental title ring. I don't, I don't, still don't know what's up with that mustache, though. I think he was a pretty boy without that mustache. That, well, that gotta go. And actually, correct you, uh, Ted DiBiase is actually a third generation superstar. Oh. And from both sides, actually, his grandmother and his grandfather were, uh, were uh, professional wrestlers. Uh, number six for me is Team Canada. Now, there's been a lot of Team Canada over the year. Um, there's been uh, Team Canada in WCW with Lance Storm, Felix Skipper. But me personally, I'm not going to put that. This is not the Team Canada I'm talking about because Team Canada and WCW I wasn't very aware of. This Team Canada was formed in 2003 uh, during the very first ever TNA World X Cup. Team Japan, Team Mexico, Team TNA, and Team, uh, Team Canada. Uh, Team Japan was in there too, I think. Oh, right. Did I mention that? Yes, you did mention that. <laughs> <Japan. laughs> you did mention know. it. But uh, there was actually three installments. Uh, first was with Teddy Hart. After Teddy Hart left, it was the Team Canada that left for a while, which was Johnny Devine, Peeney Williams, Eric Young, Bobby Roode, and Coach Scott Demore. And uh, they had a great run. Uh, there was a bit of an incident after when Johnny Devine had to leave TNA because uh, he got into an altercation outside of a nightclub where he got stabbed in the stomach and was replaced by uh, actually a Newfoundland wrestler by the name of A1. A lot of people didn't know A1 was a, obviously A1 made his. Oh, mark. I wasn't sure that he uh, got stabbed. I'm just sharing. But obviously, <laughs> of course, A1. Uh, a lot of people didn't know he was from Newfoundland, but uh, after my intense research, because I'm such a mark, mm. that's uh, and he's he's one too. He's not getting away out of this. Uh, we found out A1 was from Newfoundland. So number uh, six has to be for Team Canada for me. And for me, number six is, and a lot of people would agree with me, the McMahon family. Because it is led by, and this is my opinion, the greatest WWF villain of all time, Vince McMahon. Well, he's got a great at all. I mean, he's just a guy that everybody wants to hate. Because after the infamous uh, screw, Montreal Screwjob. Because mm -hmm. everybody knew back everybody knew back then as Vince McMahon as just... The commentator. Uh, the commentator. A very good commentator. One of the ones I personally looked to oh, uh, yeah. as a commentator myself. But after the Montreal Screwjob, he was just hated for all the Bret Hart. And really, he's still hated to this day for what happened with Bret Hart. And... And even though Vince McMahon became the greatest villain, the greatest hero, and best wrestler of all time, in my opinion, but a lot of people agree, he brought out Stone Cold Steve Austin to take him down. And really, Stone Cold Steve Austin was the everyday man that everybody wanted to be. Every, everybody wanted to be Stone Cold. In a way that everybody wanted to tell their I, boss I, to... I still remember when I was a little kid, just uh, running around, uh, had my WWF title, Stone Cold shirt net, and stick up my middle fingers. <laughs> uh, of course, back in the day, if I did that, I got spanked. <laughs> the number five for me is, uh, is uh, the Alliance, ECW and the WCW Alliance. Uh, you know, a lot of people thought that, that the storyline was absolutely garbage, which... In That's that, called morons. It's called morons because, I, in a way, I think it went on a little too long, going from 2001, 2002, November, uh, yeah. but, or half a year, whatever it was. But 2001, me being about 11, 12 years old. I mean, really, when you saw ECW and WCW invade the WWE, obviously there wasn't a lot history. of... History. It was history. And even though there wasn't a lot of well-known WCW guys there, only a very short handful, because, yeah. I mean, you didn't see Scott Hall, you didn't see Kevin Nash, you didn't see Sting. Until, like, a couple years later. Until a couple years later, which uh, the NWO came back, but obviously it was the watered-down version. Yeah. Uh, and obviously they had to join WCW and ECW together because a lot more well-known ECW stars were there. Yeah. So, number five for me was uh, the Alliance. Number five for me is the original Nexus. Now, for those of you who don't know who the Nexus is, Around 2010, ECW officially was killed off for good. And they brought up NXT, these new guys that they were to be the next talent. And Wade Barrett happened to win. And he was actually the best rookie, in my opinion. And anyway, he said, well, all of these guys deserve a spot. And when they said, no, they can't join, I'll never forget. It was just a normal wrestling match. All of a sudden, they came out. Beat the living hell out of uh, the commentators, the wrestlers, the referee, the security. Camera guys. Camera guys. Tore, um, tore the ring to pieces. Ring to pieces and that. And I must say, it actually brought stables in that back with a vengeance. I, I totally agree, especially with the Nexus theme song. I mean, I mean, they, I mean, there was a lot of things about the Nexus I personally liked. Uh, the fact that they were so unified, the fact that they had an armband with the N on it. Even the, even the theme song was really good, which is We Are One by the Twelve Stones. 
Mm. Uh, so uh, truly is number uh, great. Number four for me has to be the Ministry of Darkness, led by the Undertaker. Um, Not a purity of evil to guide you. <laughs> that was cheesy. Uh, but the Ministry of Darkness really was uh, the stable for me. Uh, it was so controversial back in the day, too, when it came to so much uh, uh, evil that was uh, going along with it. Uh, led by the Undertaker, uh, he came back as this just hated villain as like this total cult like lord leader satanic like, satanic very much and a lot of christian fundamentalists were very very mad at the wwe especially when he did his angle with putting stone cold steve austin on his uh, symbol uh, on his symbol which was a sacrifice that really looked like a cross and uh, i actually got this is the true story i got caught watching this one time and i wasn't allowed to watch wrestling for a month so uh, you know boo hoo to me and yeah. my catholic family Sure. So uh, that's number four. I mean, oh, I was, uh, the members of the ministry had to be um, Midian, who was actually one of the uh, the Godwins, uh, uh, Viscera, who was known as King Mabel, or Big Daddy V when he came back. Nah, King the, Mabel and Viscera. <laughs> I think yeah, and then Big Daddy. Big, v. Big Daddy V. He was just no. Uh, no don't no. It, it doesn't exist. We we love you, Mabel, but that was that was just horrible. You needed to put on a shirt, big man. I know. The Undertaker, obviously, and Paul Bearer. And uh, actually, not only that, he added another faction that's not on the list, but definitely deserved to be in the Ministry of Darkness, and that was a brood. Oh yeah, you know, Edge and Christian. Edge Christian and uh, Edge Christian Gangrel. Oh yeah. And uh, of and course, Gangrel actually came to Legend City Wrestling. Absolutely, Legend City Wrestling here in uh, Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, also, uh, go to uh, www.lcw.com. Yep. LCW.com for all the information on Legend City Wrestling coming up. Also, uh, www.cewnl.com for uh, all the uh, coming up uh, attractions at local uh, Newfoundland professional wrestling. And uh, what, who's your uh, number four? Number four is, uh, I might get a lot of heat for this one. The Heart Foundation. It's mm -hmm. like, what hell is he not in the top three? Well, during that time, when the, the Monday Night Wars began, they were the ones that say, you know what? Canada needs hero. And America needs to be hated. It was weird too for me when I'm watching the Heart Foundation because, like, you know, when, when they were in the United States, you know, like cheer for Americans and heroes on the Canadian. It was just such a, a, it was just such a weird time for me. And uh, me personally, uh, I actually had a chance in 1997. I got to go to the Old Memorial Arena in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland. My parents surprised me, and I got to see uh, Bret Hart. Uh, team with his brother, the late great Owen Hart, one of my all-time heroes. Oh, yeah. A man who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But obviously he's not. Well, that's, that's another story. Yes. And also the late great British Bulldog, the late great Hawk. I mean, it was just a wonderful time for this, for this young boy. Uh, number three for me has to be the corporation. And the corporation, uh, led by Vince McMahon, had to be uh, one of the greatest uh, heel factions of all time. Just the corporate greed of Vince McMahon going on. And don't forget the corporate chant, The Rock. The corporate chant, also. And one of the shocking heel, heel turns ever. Well, absolutely. I mean, The Rock well, was all about himself. And yeah, all but when you think about it, uh, during the time, around Survivor Series, that uh, The Rock well, was the people's chant. Absolutely. And Vince McMahon had a problem with the people. Money, money boys. Yeah. And uh, when The Rock was revealed to be their corporate chant instead of McFoley, a.k.a. Mankind, mm -hmm. that it was a twist. Me personally, I think The Rock looked better in a suit than McFoley anyway. No offense, Mick. Uh, mm -hmm. Number three. Oh, you're, you're number three. Yeah. Number three for me is The Alliance. Now, when you think about it, during that time, around the 90s to, to 2001, everyone watched wrestling. Everybody. Absolutely. And... When ECW went out of business, well, that wasn't a big shock. No. It when wasn't. Nitro, when WWF finally took out WCW. That was a big shock for me personally. Like, even my grandfather was shocked. And your grandfather is a big wrestling fan. Yes, he, he watched it for many years. He did. And, but when WCW and ECW formed, these two guys that were run out of business by the World Wrestling Federation. At the time. At the time. They joined together and said, you know what? We're taking back our world back. Absolutely. Because you're not taking this from us. Absolutely. And the, and the best thing about it was they had Paul Heyman, who was the, the owner of The evil genius. The evil genius. Uh, obviously, Eric Bischoff was employed with the WWF at the time. Yeah. Uh, Shane McMahon did the storyline where he fought WCW. Well, I personally think that uh, 
That worked. Yeah. It worked, but it worked. he should. But Shane should have continued to make Nitro. Because just imagine a McMahon going against another McMahon. But oh, well, ultimate storylines, I suppose. It was totally up to Vince what he wanted to do. Yeah. Number two for me has to be the Hart Foundation, and I'm not talking about the original Hart Foundation, which meant. Uh, Jim, the Evan Neidhart, and Brett. I'm talking about the one in 1987, the one that, once again, I mentioned when I went to go see in St. John's. Uh, Brett, Owen, Davey Boy, Jim, the Evan Neidhart, and Brian Pillman. Now, Pillman, he was a good, good he, was, he, was, he, was the, he was the founding father when it came to become the high-flying wrestling. Oh, yeah, the only thing I would have done... Pioneer, actually. Yeah, he was. The only Besides thing, the Lucha Lord. I'm sorry if I'm... Oh, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> I've stunned you a whole day. Uh, True. The only... Yeah, he agrees with me on that. Uh, the only thing I would have changed... He's different... Uh, instead of Brian Pillman, me personally, if they were on better terms and he didn't have so many personal demons, I, I personally would have put the, the Dynamite Kid in. Because really, they were all family. Once upon a time. Uh, who's your number two? Number two is, well, I don't mean to repeat yeah, or anything, but it's got to be the ministry. Because as a little kid, five years old, when I started watching, I grew up in the best time, in my opinion, the Attitude Era. Now, watching The Undertaker come out with that satanic gimmick and burying Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, you know as a little kid, seeing your, little, your childhood hero being buried by the devil himself, you know, it's gonna, you're gonna be hate, hatred and so much hatred for the ministry. But when, you know, you grow up, you realize that, you know, heels got the best heat because everyone watch into the boo at him and hate him. I don't really think I don't really think he came down to I don't think it really came to the point where he had so much heat. I think it was at the point that they had he had more the kind of heat he had was more we hate you but we're not gonna say anything because we're afraid. Yeah. And believe me, Undertaker and, did make a lot of And Undertaker fun. actually have one of the most disturbing endings to any WrestleMania match. Hell in the cell with the boss man. When he yes. when he hanged him like it, you will never see anybody have the boss do in wrestling anymore. Oh no, Big Boss Man was a really very unique person, and he would done anything for business. Now, number one uh, for me, obviously the the faction that really put factions on the map, and that would be the Four Horsemen. And uh, this is not the original Four Horsemen. This is the Four Horsemen that everybody really knows and really respects the most. Barry Windham, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, and of course the Nature Boy Ric Flair, managed by. And it's by James J. Dillon. And these guys really were the it factor. They were they were the corporation before the corporation. They were everything that we wanted to be. Uh, just to, I mean, me personally, everything we wanted to be, uh, you know, just wanted to be using riding, jet flying, trail blazing, eyebrow raising. That's more of the rock, but uh, we, we, I mean, we wanted the pretty ladies. We wanted all the money, and uh, really, Ric Flair knew that. We couldn't do it. He make he he made a habit of saying, "I got a bunch of jewel encrusted robes in my closet. I get all the pretty women, and I make a million dollars a year." That's what we all wanted to be. And and plus, that uh, another reason why that will be good because that um, yeah, like one of the brutalest wrestlers on Anderson. Absolutely. And you have the great. Maybe not the greatest, but one of the greatest heavyweight champions, Ric Flair. Yes. 16-time world champion. Record probably never be beat. And not only that, you had uh, you had the the young buck at the time, which was uh, Barry Windham, who, oh, yeah. uh, who was the son of uh, Black Jack Mulligan. And, of course, you had Tully Blanchard, who was the speed of the of the two, or of the four, and really just somebody that you wanted to beat the living tar out of, but you just couldn't because he was so slippery. Yeah. And who's your number one? Number one is... The New World Order. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing, though. The original New World Order. Nash, Steiner, and Hogan. No, now, no, 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 no. Nash, Scott Hall, and Hogan. Oh, yeah, don't mind me. We've been talking about Scott mm -hmm. Steiner all night, so. <laughs> Set. But anyway, you know, these three guys came from WWF, and when Scott Hall came there first, it was like, what the hell is he doing here? It's like, what the hell is Razor Ramon doing in WCW? And then when Kevin Nash came, it's like, oh my god, okay, Diesel's there. Diesel's here, who's next? And then all of a sudden, when Hulk Hogan put that leg drop on Macho Man, Macho Man that actually slapped the world 
wrestling world right in the face. Because absolutely, because everybody knew Hulk Hogan. I mean, Hulk Hogan was never a heel. He was the face of he the was, 80s. He was the face of the 80s. I mean, he, even his, not until the early set or mid to late 70s, he was a heel. And for him to turn his back on the fans after all these years, I mean, I mean, kids were drunk. Trash was being flamed and everything. Uh, mean Gene Oakland said he got a beer can in the nose, gave him a bloody nose, and like there, there was almost a full scale riot. I mean, all the uh, Hulk Hogan merchandise went uh, what, ripped and everything. It was ripped, and they wanted their money back. Money and, back. Oh man, it was just. A, it and was, they actually, the NWO, made WCW win, win the war for the first couple years. Because at that time, the WWF was winning. I mean, hands down. And then after yeah. a while, it just came down to a point where WCW needed to do something big, and that was the thing. Now, Eric Bischoff really was the genius when it yeah. came to that. And what's more bigger than uh, turning Hulk Hogan heel? Absolutely. Never, I mean, back then, I mean, it was just unthinkable. Um, so that is our top ten best factions. We will be back later on with a, another installment of uh, WrestleMania. Um, and obviously we've done our top ten best, and uh, we're going to think about doing our top ten worst. If we can't come up with ten uh, bad uh, factions, it will just narrow it down to five. I think we should do that anyway because this video did go a little long. So... Uh, WrestleManiac, I'm the White Rose of Newfoundland, Charles Walsh. Now Dylan Skinner. And thanks for watching, and we'll hope to see you next time.